All right. Well, you guys, we're, we're in the beginning parts of this series for the summer uh, on relationships called The Struggle is Real. And, and here's some of the bottom lines. I just want to throw it out there. Here's some of the bottom lines. I want you to remember, by the end of the summer, you'll be able to say this in your sleep, okay? So there's just a couple of things. One is we are designed for relationships, right? We are designed for them. In Genesis 1 and 2, it said that it wasn't good for people to be alone. And so he made uniquely there this woman named uh, Eve for this man named Adam and it, because there wasn't right to be alone. We were made for relationships. That's what it's all about. But, there's a big but in it. We always circle our butt here at, uh, at Quest. So circle your butt. Uh, is that, here's the deal, that they can be a source of incredible pain in our lives. And you go to Genesis chapter 3 and 4, which affected the rest of the entire scriptures, is we have Adam and Eve hiding from each other, blaming each other, shaming each other, and we have Ad, uh, Cain and Abel, brothers getting in a conflict, and Cain kills Abel. That's the where it started. And it's been that way ever since. The conflict and the difficulty and the struggle. And it doesn't mean that it's not worth it, but it's just the way it is, reality. And even in this thing called marriage. So, but that's kind of the bottom line. Here's kind of the bigger bottom line. Is we are designed for relationship, but along the way those relationships got all messed up. And our only hope, our only hope is the spirit-filled life where God would instill the spirit of God in us so that we might have the ability, and this is the key verse for the entire summer, is that we would mutually submit one to another. We would submit to each other. And you think, okay, what does that look like? That's in Ephesians 5. We'll come back to that. But that's kind of the key role of all relationships, that we, be, we would sit, submit one to another. And so, as Luke said earlier, we started with some two key things. I do all this assessment with young couples uh, getting married and with married couples. And in it, the determining factors of their success in a relationship are two, the first two, which are communication and conflict resolution. Conflict, if you can't resolve conflict, you can't have a relationship. Because there's going to be conflict, right? Genesis 3 and 4, that conflict has continued all the way through. And if you can't solve conflict, you can't have a relationship. And when we solve conflict, we can either do it way over here to the left on this next slide, uh, where we do these escape responses, and it's all about me, right? This escape response would be denial, flight, even suicide. It's all about me. How can I get away from this conflict? Or we go way over to the right-hand side, which is an attack response, which is all about you, where I'm going to say, I'm going to assault you, I'm going to have litigation against you, or I'm going to murder you, exactly like Cain did with Abel. And these are, these are peace-breaking strategies. But in the middle here, there are peacemaking strategies, which are about us, about one another, about having relationships. And we can either overlook an offense, we can reconcile it, we can negotiate it, we can either may- maybe bring in some other people and help us mediate it, or even arbitrate it, or even hold us accountable. But we want to have a peacemaking in our conflict resolution. And this is really hard. Hardest thing ever, I think. Okay? Now, the next thing we talked about last week was communication. So if you can communicate and solve conflict, in communication we had three basic things. One is learning to speak to be understood. Not to win or overwhelm, but simply be understood. And to listen with a heart to understand, not to build a defense. I am an expert. I know how to build a defense. I listen and I look for the crack in the argument. And I have the ability to go right to it. Boom. And I win. And I lose, right? Of course I lose. It's stupid. It's just human nature to do such dumb things. So to speak to be understood, listen to be in order to be understood, and then to speak and listen in order to heal, in order for there to be redemption. That's what communication is all about. And it's hard. I'm going to suggest that it's the most important, but probably the most difficult work you'll ever do in a relationship is communication. Secondly, communication takes practice. It takes a lot of practice. It takes an amazing amount of practice to communicate well. I talk to older couples that have been married quite a while, and they're still working at it. Ten years? Nothing. (laughs) Just hold on to your seat, sweetheart, because it's going to get harder. (laughs) Twenty years? Even harder. Thirty years? Hard, too. Thirty-four years? How many people? Let's go forty years. How many people? Forty years have been married. Wow, okay. Okay. And just so, 50 years? Oh, 50 years. 
Look at that. Anybody been married 60 years? And they've got it down, just so you know. <laughs> all right. Well, you guys, let's go back to Ephesians chapter 5 and kind of see where this has all started and where it's going. In Ephesians chapter 5, it says this in the beginning. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. And then he says like, this amazing statement. Walk in love. Walk in it. In this area called love. As Christ gave, gave us, uh, loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Walk in love the same way that Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Wow, it's an amazing thought. And then later in the chapter, look at verse 15. It says, if you're going to walk in love, then it says, look carefully how you walk. Be careful how you walk in life. If you're going to walk in love, you have to be careful. It's not just natural. It's not easy. You have to work at it. So walk, look carefully how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. And don't be foolish. Don't be idiotic. Don't be stupid. But understand what the will of the Lord is and what he's doing in life. And then he says this amazing statement. Don't get drunk with wine. For that's just a waste. It's debauchery. It's just, you know, just, it's just a waste of life. But it's controlling of your life, Right? It's an addiction sometimes to get drunk with wine. And it becomes your best friend. When your best friend is something that's not true, you have an addiction. And it becomes that way. What it empowers you. But he says, don't be empowered by the wine, but be filled with the Spirit of God. Let it empower you. And then there's four results. And we've talked about this before, but look at this. Just, uh, verse 19. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, which means to take God's word and God's truth and infuse it into our discussions with, about life so that we, we wrestle with truth in life and things that are encouraging and helpful to real life. Second result is this, singing and making melody to the Lord in your heart, having a heart that's full of joy. That's a result of being filled with the Spirit. Third result, look at this in verse 20, giving thanks always and everything to, the, to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, being thankful in life, even for the things that are hard. You're not thankful because you, oh, that's so great. You know, that was horrible. I'm so glad. No, you, you, you give thanks because you know that God works all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And you give thanks. I'm really thankful for the weather today. It's an outdoor wedding, and it was going to kill us if it was a week ago. Um, and today it's going to be a little nicer. I'm really grateful. But even if it was terrible today, he said, be thankful. You know, you woke up this morning. He didn't have to have you wake up, Kevin, this morning. So be thankful. And then, but then look at this in verse 21. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. That is the evidence of the spirit-filled life, is submitting to each other because we love him so much, because we honor him so much, because we love he, what he's doing. And to submit to each other because of who God is. Wow, that's a pretty incredible thought. This idea of submitting means this. It means to yield and to offer. It means to yield to the other person but also to offer yourself to the other person. Yielding seems passive. It's not actually passive, but it feels that way in a sense of saying, I'm going to yield to you. But it also says, but I'm not just going to yield. I'm going to offer myself to you. I'm going to come to the table that all, with all that I am, with all that I think, with all that I have to offer, and I'm going to put it on the table, and I'm going to, I'm going to risk being rejected or disagreed with. I'm going to even offer myself and risk being wrong. I'm going to risk being wrong, and you might tell me and help me know that I'm wrong, and I'll have to go, oh, bummer, I'm wrong. But if you don't ever come to the table with that, then you're always going to be what we call, the next one is this, is not only yielding and offering, but to stop resisting each other and to stop hiding from one another. That's what Adam and Eve did, right? They hid from each other. They covered up, and they did the shame-blame game with each other. Well, she and he and she did this and he did that, and God, you're the one who put her here. It's your fault in the first place. And they begin to do the shame-blame game. It's what we sometimes relationships end up being. Well, this morning we're going to talk then, after verse 21, in verses 22 to 33, he's going to talk about marriages. Taking this principle of submitting to each other and apply it to marriage. The first relationship God created, a man and a woman. And he's, we're going to now talk about that. And it's not all going to be easy, so, but we're going to jump in. Look at this. Um, there, when we talk about marriage, often when I do a wedding, uh, in fact, I use this a lot in weddings, 
in, well, I say there's three rings in marriage, right? Uh, there's the engagement ring. Uh, it's when you find someone and you go, wow, I think there's a lot of potential here. I think I'd like to see if she'd be interested in doing the rest of life together. And if she says yes, whoa, I'm kind of committed. Uh, you know, and, uh, and so you, you go and ask. And you go, I, I think there's, you don't know everything about each other, but you say, okay. And then there's the wedding ring, right? And the wedding ring is when you say, all right, come no matter what, I'm sticking it out, I'm staying uh, you know, and I can't wait, you know, you're like all excited on that wedding day, and it's a wedding ring. And then for those of who, you who are married, you know, it's the suffering that comes after that. Uh, that's the, and for the, those of you who are married, you know exactly what I'm talking about, you know. And if, and if you're single, you're going, really? I don't want to do that. But, um, uh, but there's the suffering. So I usually say this at weddings, and then when Jake got married several uh, months ago, Jake said, I said, hey, I'm not going to use that three ring thing. He goes, oh, thank God. You know, he's so glad because he's heard it a thousand times, you know. And so I said, okay. Uh, but then at his wedding, I came up with the seven rings of marriage. Uh, but before we go there, look at this, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Uh, he's talking about marriage and singleness. Look at this. This is what Paul wrote. He says, if you do marry, you haven't sinned. Oh, that's nice of him, you know. And, uh, but then he says, and if you're a betrothed woman marries, she hasn't sinned either. But look at this next line. Circle it. Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles. That's what he says. And, and I don't, we don't know that Paul was married. But I think he'd watched enough marriages to go, well, that can be hard. You know, because there's dynamics, right? Making one out of two isn't easy, right? Nothing in life. If we're making, making it into one, it's easy. So he says, you're going to have worldly troubles. And, and Paul says then, and I would spare you that, you know, why don't you take it easy and stay single? Now, that, I think, you know, it's not that we should all stay single. There's, there's marriage is appropriate. Obviously, my daughter's getting married. But, but it, there's some troubles in it. It's reality. So there are really seven rings in marriage. There's, first of all, there's the engagement ring. There's the wedding ring. And then there's the discover ring. You know, we, we spend time discovering each, things about each other. And some of those things are awesome and fun and beautiful. And some things are not so awesome and not so fun and not so beautiful. And you start going, oh, wow, had I known that. I mean, at the end of our first year, Diane and I said this. Diane was really secretly thinking, I made a huge mistake. And that's humbling to say. And I was thinking, this is either going to be a really long life or a really short marriage. And we needed to grow. We needed to change. Some of the things we discovered weren't so sweet. So, but if you find some of those things, then you enter into this, the persevering. You have to persevere. Part of marriage is persevering, working through it, sticking with it, not giving up. And if you persevere, then you can get to this place called the restoring. You're going to restore and rebuild and make it better. That's part of the deal. And if you'll work your way through the discovering and the persevering and the restoring, then you can get to the prospering. That's where we wanted to get to in the first place, right? We wanted to go straight from the wedding ring to the prospering. Unfortunately, you can't get there. You have to go through these other ones. And then you get to the prospering, where you can begin to prosper. It grows. It's dynamic. It's fun. Um, there's still conflict, but you can get to the prospering. And then, with time, through that learning process, you get to the mentoring where you can begin to share this with other people and encourage them. And in a nation, and in a country, and in a culture where marriage is falling apart, this mentoring could be the best thing ever to encourage other couples, invest in them, help them be successful when it's really hard to be successful. Okay? So these are the seven rings of marriage. But let's go on in, in verse 22. It says this. It's going to address the wives first. Let's put it in a box. Wives, here we go. Submit to your own husbands. Now, you talk about an anti-cultural thing to say. You know, our culture is like, yeah, yeah, stick that, you know. Uh, and you can hang that where, you know, right on your beak, buckwheat. You know, we're not doing that. Submit to your own husbands. But listen to it first. Submit. What does it mean? To yield and to offer, right? Don't just, you've got to enter into the relationship. And defer to this guy, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but to submit to your own husbands. It doesn't say that women submit to every man. That's not true in the, in biblically. But it says to your own husband. You see, all you, you gals, you don't need to submit to me. 
We don't submit to other men, right? You submit to your own husband. Uh, as to the Lord, now that kind of puts a whole deal on it, right? If you're going to submit to the Lord, what does that look like? So do it in a similar fashion. So now it's going to explain it. Look at this, 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, as, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. So the husband is the head. Here, I want to stop just for a second. Talk about what it means to be the head. What it feels like. Let me use the illustration of an umbrella just for a moment. Uh, what I think it looks like and feels like in our culture is that being the head is a covering. So there's this concept in the Old Testament of the husband be, being the covering, the canopy, the protector, and the provider for his wife. That's what God is. So here, and it says, just as Christ is the head, Christ is this covering like an umbrella over the, over the church, over people. He is the protector and the provider, the lover of, of these people, and he is a canopy for that. And so in a similar way, the husband's supposed to be a canopy, a protector, and a provider for her. And then she's supposed to submit. And what it feels like in our culture is there's this thing, famous thing in St. Louis. It's called the, the Brock, Brock Abrella. Uh, but Brock Abrella? Brock Abrella. So Lou Brock tried to... Tried to uh, market this thing called the Brock umbrella. It was an umbrella that covered your head and it strapped to your head. And it was just big enough for yourself. You know, right? And so what it feels like, I think, for women in this, in our culture, is that we're saying, hey, look, you need to let him be a covering and the umbrella is just big enough for him. And you need to somehow squeeze underneath that, which is going to require that you demean yourself. And you're going to have to get up, get up underneath this little umbrella that's on top of his head because it's, he's the king, because he's the dictator, because he's what it's all about. And so you need to just kind of somehow squeeze yourself down into this little thing and get underneath his umbrella that's on his head. Right? But that's not what it is at all. What it means to be the protector and the provider is to provide a place that's where she can thrive. Not because she's unable on her own. She's a very capable person. There's equality under Christ. But that the husband says, my job is to protect and provide for her, and my umbrella needs to be big enough for her to live and thrive. So it's going to look a lot more like this, right? And so she can get underneath here, and we can be together. And I'm going to say, I'm going to commit my life to you. I'm going to die for you as Christ died for the church, and we're going to have this thing, and you are going to be able to thrive here. Now, Brad, who's marrying Tori, I mean, I think he's going to need one of those golf umbrellas, you know, because, uh, because Tori's, I mean, she's going to be moving around, right? I mean, she's got a lot of, she's spunky, you know what I mean? And, and I mean, we're going to get him like the biggest umbrella known to mankind, and, uh, and it's going to be a challenge. But that's his job, is not to demean her or squash her, but to provide for her and protect her like an umbrella, like God does for us, right? That's his job. And so we go back here, for the husband is the head of the wife, someone who's going to provide for and protect her as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and he is himself its savior. Wow. Now look at this. Now the church submits to Christ. So also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Now can you submit to a guy who's going to protect you and provide for you and care for you and value you so deeply that he's going to say, I want you to be everything God meant you to be, and I'm going to be your biggest fan. And I'm going to be the one who dies for you. I'm going to be the one that sacrifices for you. I think a woman would go, all right, let's go. Man, that works. Look here in 25. Now, husbands, just so you know, he says far more to the husband than he says to the wife. If he's going to kick someone's backside, it's the guys in this he's going to kick. Husbands, let's box it. Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, died for her, sought her good her redemption. Husbands, love your wives that way. Look at this. That he might sanctify her. Now he's going to get into a discussion here more about the church in a sense, but he still carries on this marriage theme that he might sanctify her. Sanctify means set her apart for a holy purpose. That's what he did for us. He set us aside for a holy purpose. And men, set her aside for a holy purpose. Because she's awesome. Wow. Set her aside. Having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. So that he might present the church to himself in splendor. When I left the house this morning. Which I left very early. Because there were a lot of people arriving. It was full of gals. 
all the bridesmaids, which are about 20 of them. I'm not, you know, I don't know how many. They're, they're all over the place. You know? And then these, these makeup artists come. And there's hair people there. And it's like so much estrogen going around our house. It was unbelievable. You know? And I walked in, and there, the makeup gals were doing their makeup. And, and I was like, can you help me? And they looked at me, and they said, you're beyond help. You know? So uh, <laughs> hair, mm, that ain't going to happen. Makeup, no, nope, out the door. But so th this afternoon, though, we're going to present those ladies, even my wife and Tori, in her splendor. It's going to be this beautiful thing. Husbands, present her in her splendor. In the gorgeousness of her, is what he's saying. And look at this, he goes on and he says, without spot or wrinkle. That's what makeup does. You know, without spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Husbands, love her that way, deeply, to bring out her splendor, to bring out her beauty, and how awesome she is. Look in 28. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it. Men, love your wives in a way that nourishes and cherishes them. They feel cherished and loved so deeply and nourished by this relationship. Wow. Just as Christ does the church. Because we are members of his body. And then he quotes Genesis here, right? Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And that's not just physically. That's deep down inside at a heart level, at an emotional level, at a soulish level. We're going to be one. We don't lose our personhood, but we become committed to each other to be one. Now look in verse 32. It says, this mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. This mystery is amazing. But look in verse 33. It says, however, let's circle it, however. And he's going to bring it back to the husband and the wife, right? He, so he says this. Now let's circle the whole, the whole verse. Let each of you, so he's writing to men here, interestingly enough. He says, let each of you love his wife as himself. He's kind of going to make the bottom line here. Guys, love her. And then, weird, this is totally weird, right? He says, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. You guys, in our culture, that seems very strange. Why do you use a different word? In our culture, we'd say, hey, love each other. Hey, love her. Hey, you, love him. It all works. And it does work that way. But it's interesting here, he changes words. I had a friend who was getting his PhD at the University of Southern California in counseling. Uh, and one of his classmates, a really good friend of his, was a Jewish girl. Uh, and they would talk about counseling. They would talk about emotional world. They would talk about the spiritual world a lot. Um, and he, being a Christian, would add some scripture things periodically. He would say, well, I've been thinking about this, and this is what the Bible says here. And finally, she just said, you know what? I've kind of had it with your Bible thing. Could you, like, not talk about that anymore? I just, you know, just stuff it. I don't want to hear it anymore. So he said, okay, and he didn't talk about it anymore. But then one day, he was talking with some other classmates, and he was talking about this dynamic between a husband and a wife that he needs to love her. What her biggest need is is to be loved, and his biggest need is to be respected. And she overheard the conversation. And she said, that is brilliant. Where'd you get that? And he said, I can't tell you. <laughs> and she got mad. She said, what do you mean you can't tell me? She goes, I can't tell you. What do you mean? Why would you do that? Because I promised not to tell you. She goes, you never promised me that. He goes, yes, I did. You'd ask me never to give you any biblical things. She goes, don't tell me that's in the Bible. He goes, yeah, it's in Ephesians. The biggest need of a woman is to be loved because when she's loved, she knows that inside of love is embedded respect. If a guy loves a woman deeply, nourishes her and cherishes her, presents her in all of her splendor without wrinkle or without blemish, she knows she's respected, but it comes with love. How many gals want to say, a guy to come to you and say, well, I really respect you, but I don't love you? For a gal, you might as well just, you know, cut her legs off. I mean, you're like, are you kidding she wants to be loved, but she knows that real love comes with respect. And then he goes on and he says, and let the wife see to it that she respect her husband. 
if you tell a guy, I love you, but I don't respect you, you might as well reach in his chest and rip his heart out, put it on the ground and start grinding it under your heel. It'll destroy him. He wants to be respected. And when you really respect wives, your husbands, he knows it's embedded with love. He knows it. Because you give him the honor and respect for what he's been called to in his role and his responsibility. And that's why in our culture we've lost this. This incredible reality and cycle of what's supposed to happen. Men, love your wives. Wives, respect your husbands. So, where do we go with it from here? So, therefore, what now? What do we do? Okay, let me just say this. First thought. Love and respect are gifts that we offer one another rather than rewards that we earn. That's so against our culture. You know, it's like, okay, if you want me to love you, you better act lovable. And if you don't act lovable, I'm not going to love you. Of course, where's the line, right? Where's the line at which you're lovable enough for me to love you? You know, and, and we can never reach that line because none of us are all that lovable at times. We have our stuff, if you know what I mean. You know, and so, but it's a gift we give. Men, to love your wife is a decision. To like your wife means, is, is a response to what she does. To love her is a commitment of your character to her. To love her is a decision you make, no matter what she does, is to offer her love, to nourish and cherish her, present her as Christ does the church, as, as someone in her splendor, with, all, with no blemish or wrinkle. You love her because you choose to love her. It's a gift that we offer. And here's the deal, gals. A, your respect for your husband is a gift that you give him. He doesn't deserve it all the time. Men have a tendency periodically, once in a blue moon, to be knuckleheads. <laughs> if you know what I mean. And if you're going to wait for him to be so respectable that you'll reserve it, and if he's, if he's not quite as respectable as you wish, you begin to take it away. You'll destroy the relationship. It's a gift that you offer him. Man, your love is a gift you offer your wife. And, and here's the deal. Love and respect can be and ought to be a reciprocal pattern that cycles up, right? So when I love Diane and she responds with respect, guess what I want to do? Do I want to take advantage of her? Of course not. I want to love her back. And she offers respect. It's a cycle that goes up. It builds. It's powerful. It's dynamic. Love and respect is a cycle that's reciprocal, and it goes up, and it builds a relationship. Now, opposite of that, look at this. A neglect of love and respect are gifts that we withhold from one another. And that's why I think well, where we find ourselves in so many relationships, we find ourselves withholding love and respect. Well, I'm not going to give it to you. You don't deserve it. I don't want you to feel good about it. I don't want you to have grace. I don't want you to have mercy. I want you to pay the price, buckaroo, for what you've done and said. And I'm mad at you and I want to punish you. And so we withhold love and respect. They're gifts that we withhold from one another and, and the demand uh, others can earn. We want them to earn it. And it doesn't work that way. Look at this. Love and respect can be and will be a reciprocal pattern that cycles down if we don't give it to each other. You don't love me, I don't feel loved, I'm not going to respect you, or you're not going to respect me with your words and actions, and I'm not going to love you, and it just cycles down, right? If you can just pattern your, your arguments over that. We just learn how to hit each other's buttons, right? You're like, oh, really, you said that? You've said that 15 times in our relationship, 500 times, and I, I know exactly how to respond to that, and I'll disrespect you, and I'll stop loving you, and it cycles down into a disaster. Because we refuse to give each other the gift of love and respect. So here's the deal. The struggle is real. It really is real. And so here's the bottom line again. Let me just throw it out there. We are designed for relationships. But along the way, those relationships got all messed up. And the only hope we have is a spirit-filled life that gives us an ability to submit to one another, to yield to each other, stop resisting each other, to offer ourselves to each other, to stop hiding from one another. That's what it means. And so let me ask you, what do you think? What do you, you don't have to answer, but what do you think about all this? 
here's maybe, maybe what you've thought, what these people are thinking. First of all, is, I think I've been cycling down. I think I've been in a downward cycle with my, with my spouse. What do I do? Maybe you're thinking this. I've been so contemptuous towards my husband. I've held him in contempt because he wasn't what I wanted or what I want to demand. And so I am going to punish him for it and hold him in contempt. It happens all the time. We're bitter towards each other. We build walls. We're contemptuous. Or maybe you're saying this, I've been so painfully bitter towards my wife. She's been on me. She's nagged me. I'm mad at her. I'm painfully bitter towards her. And bitterness can can grow. And it takes over and destroys. Or maybe we're all saying this. If we want to cycle up, maybe we need to start by having reverence for Christ. If we're going to submit to one another out of reverence for him, that maybe we need to go to him and be reverent towards him so that we can love and respect one another. I think that's maybe, in fact, I'm saying exactly. That's where we need to start. Because here's the deal. A relationship with Christ is the cornerstone and starting line of any and all relationships. That's where it starts. And so what we want to do this morning is we want to come and worship him. But that's where it starts. So, band, why don't you go ahead and come up. But let me introduce it. We're going to take communion together. Uh, Here at Quest, we do it by what we call intinction, uh, which is an ancient old thing of the church where you take the bread and you dip it in the juice and you take it together right there. And so if we need to submit to one another, and especially in our marriages, out of reverence for Christ, then coming and saying, hey, we want to give ourselves to him, that we want to take what his body that was broken for us on a cross and his blood that was shed on that cross for the forgiveness of our sins, if that's where it starts, then we need to come and we say, God, I'm giving myself to you. Christ, I'm going to worship you. And when I walk out this door, I want you to fill me and empower me with your spirit so that I can love my wife, and I can respect my husband. Or if you're not married, to say, I want to grow in that relationship. I want to grow in that relationship with you so that when and if that ever happens, that I want to be grounded in you, Christ, so that I can be that kind of person. Okay? So I invite you to come and worship him. So if you're serving communion this morning, if you go ahead and take your stations, Uh, And so there are four stations, really five. There's two up front. There's two back here. And over here on the table is a gluten-free station, if that's what you need to do. But to come and bring yourself um, to really worship him so that we can be filled with him, so that we can learn to love each other and be in relationship, okay? Uh, There's only a few people that shouldn't take communion, the scriptures tell us. One, if you're not a believer this morning, then this would probably kind of just be a religious exercise. So if you're kind of an inquirer or a skeptic, we're so glad you're here. But I wouldn't ask you to be, um, not have integrity. I'd ask you to be, say, you don't have to do this. You know, don't be embarrassed if you don't. Um, The only other people the scriptures tell us to not take communion are people who are vehemently and violently out of fellowship with God, saying, you know what, I'm walking on my own and I have no interest in obeying Christ. None. It says don't do this. It would be to your own detriment if you did. Um, But these people would love to present the body of Christ to you. Um, So what I'd like to do is just have us pray. Prepare your own heart. And then come as we do this randomly. You can go to any station at any time uh, to take communion. So let's pray. Father, the struggle really is real. We wish it wasn't. We wish that we lived in a world of Prince Charming and Sleeping Beauty. But that is long gone. And we need you to help us have relationships like you designed it. That you want to empower us. You want to do that in our lives. And so we come here not because we have anything proud in our own souls. We have only thankfulness towards you. We surrender ourselves to you that we would really honestly say thank you for dying on that cross for us, shedding your blood for us, giving your body broken for us, 
for the, for the reality that you forgive. You make us new. You empower us to live. So if there's anything between you and God that's wrong, I'd say just take care of it right here. It just gives you a minute to kind of lay it out there and let his blood cover it and make you clean. That he might present you flawless and blameless without spot or wrinkle in all of the splendor that he made us for. That he wants to nourish and cherish you. Father, we thank you for your presence here this morning. We thank you for the reality of, the, of your spirit that empowers us. That we can be more like you. Father, we look forward to the day that Christ the Son returns. It turns the world upside down. And it's really going to be right side up. But between now and then, may we walk with you. And we come here to remember and worship you. And what your Son did for us. And so it's in his name that gives us the ability to come before you. And so it's in his name that we pray. Amen. You guys, I invite you to any of these stations to celebrate what Christ did for you.